order questions to the Prime Minister. Mrs Cheryl Murray. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the House will be aware that today the Crown Prosecution Service announced charging decisions in relation to Hillsborough. I know from working closely with the families when I was Home Secretary that this will be a day of mixed emotions for them. But the House will understand that I cannot say anything further on matters that are now subject to a criminal prosecution. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mrs Cheryl Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over the past months, I have had swastikas carved into posters, social media posts like Burn the Witch and Stab the Sea, people putting Labour Party posters on my home, photographed them and pushed them through my letterbox, and someone even urinated on my office door. Hardly kinder, gentler politics. <laughs> can my right honourable friend suggest what can be done to stop this in- intimidation, which, Mr Speaker, may well be putting off good people from serving in this place? My, uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this issue, and she was not the only person who experienced this sort of intimidation during the election campaign. Particularly, I am sorry to say, this sort of intimidation was experienced by female candidates during the election campaign. I believe that this sort of behaviour has no place in our democracy. And I think she is right. I think it could put good people off from serving in this House. We want more people to become engaged, more people to want to stand for election to this House. And I think, uh, particularly as I stand here and I see the plaque that has been dedicated to the late Joe Cox, that we should all remember what Joe said. We are far more united and have far more in common with each other than the things that divide us. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I welcome the announcement by the Crown Prosecution Service this morning that they are going to prosecute six people in relation to Hillsborough. This prosecution, the inquiry and this development only happened because of the incredible work done by the Hillsborough Justice Campaign, Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham and other colleagues around this House. And I think, I think, I think we should pay tribute to all of those that spent a great deal of time trying to ensure there was justice for those that died at Hillsborough. Mr Speaker, 79 people died in Grenfell Tower. Our thoughts are with the families and friends of those that have died, those still unaccounted for, and those who are going to live with the trauma of this horrific and utterly avoidable tragedy for the rest of their lives. Last Thursday, the Prime Minister said she expected to appoint a judge to chair the inquiry within the next few days. We haven't had any further news on this. Can she now update the House when an appointment will be made and what will be the timetable for the inquiry? Well, may I first of all say to the right honourable gentleman, I think we are all welcome the fact that after so many years of waiting, the Hillsborough families. Uh, and those, there were different groups within Hillsborough, not just the Hillsborough Justice Campaign. There were the Hillsborough families who came together, and the work that was done by Margaret Aspinall and others has been absolutely yeah, yeah. exemplary. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, as I said, obviously today will be a day of really mixed emotions for them. But I welcome the fact that charging decisions have been taken. I think that is an important step forward. Um, the Right Honourable Gentleman asked me to update in relation to Grenfell Tower. And, uh, Mr Speaker, if I may, I would like to update the House on a number of aspects. Uh, we all know what an unimaginable tragedy this was, and our thoughts will continue to be with all those who have been affected by it. Um, As of this morning, the cladding from 120 tower blocks across the country in 37 local authority areas had been tested and had failed the combustibility test. Given the 100% failure rate, uh, we are very clear with local authorities and housing associations they should not wait for test results. They should get on with the job of the fire safety checks, and indeed they are doing that, and they should take any action necessary, and the Government will support them in doing that. Um, the Secretary of State, the Community Secretary, has set up an independent expert advisory panel to advise on the measures that need to be taken, which is meeting this week. On the housing offer, 
282 temporary, good quality temporary properties have been identified, 132 families have had their needs uh, assessed, and 65 offers of temporary accommodation have already been made to uh, families. The payment from the fund that we've been made available, the discretionary fund, those payments continue. As of this morning, nearly one and a quarter million pounds of payments has been, have been paid. And additionally, we're giving an extra one million pounds to uh, the local consortia of charities, trusts and foundations, which have been doing such important work. On the issue of the public inquiry, I do expect this uh, to, as to be able to name a judge uh, soon. As the right honourable gentleman will know, the process is that the Lord Chief Justice uh, recommends the name of a judge. What we want to do is to ensure that as the process is going forward for that inquiry, that the survivors, the families concerned, um, um, do have involvement with that, and it's that work that we're currently doing. Jeremy Corbyn. I thank the Prime Minister for that answer, but I hope that she's able to stick to her promise of everyone being rehoused within three weeks, because at the moment it doesn't look anything like that target's going to be achieved. She, I hope, understands the fear that so many people have living in tower blocks at the present time all around the country. In 2014, the All-Party Fire and Safety Group wrote to the DCLG warning, and I quote, today's buildings have a much higher content of readily available combustible material. There have been contradictory messages from the government. Can the Prime Minister give a categorical answer? Is cladding with a combustible core, such as polyethylene, legal for use on high-rise buildings? And was the cladding of Grenfell Tower legal? The situation is, in relation to the cladding, that the building regulations identify the cladding which is compa compatible with the building regulations and that which is non-compliant com um, compliant with those building regulations. My understanding is that this particular cladding was not compliant with uh, the building regulations. This raises wider issues, as the House will recognise, and it is important that we are careful in our, how we talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. Because there, there is a criminal investigation taking place, and it's important that we allow the police to do that criminal investigation and take the decisions that they need to take. But there is a much wider issue here. As we have seen from the number of buildings where the cladding has failed the combustibility test, from those uh, uh, samples that have been sent in already from local authorities and housing associations, this is a much wider issue. It's an issue that has been um, continuing for many years, for decades, in terms of cladding being put up in buildings. There are real questions as to how this has happened, why it's happened, and how we can ensure that it doesn't happen in the future. That is why I'm clear that in addition to the inquiry that needs to identify the specific issues for Grenfell Tower, what happened in relation to Grenfell Tower and who was responsible, we will also need to look much more widely at why it is that over decades, under different governments, under different, uh, different councils, um, uh, material has not been put up on these tower blocks that is non-compliant with the building regulations. There's a very wide issue here. We need to make sure we get to the bottom of it, and that's what we're going to do. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, last Thursday, the Prime Minister <clears throat> told my right honourable friend, the member for Leeds Central, that you would make the results of the Grenfell Tower cladding, cladding testing public within 48 hours. And I'm not sure if she's actually done that with her statement today. Uh, yes, as of yesterday, and the Prime Minister just confirmed this, 120 high-rise blocks across Britain have had fire safety tests and failed them. What timetable has the Prime Minister set for such tests to be completed, including on schools and hospitals in every part of the country? And what plans does she have to compel the testing of high-rise buildings such as private sector office blocks and hotels, which may also have compostable cladding material on them? Uh, if I can just say to the right honourable gentleman, what I said last week in the statement was that my understanding was that the police were going to make a statement about the issue of the cladding material within 48 hours, and I think the police then did make a statement about the, uh, about the position. Uh, in relation to the test, my message is a very simple one. As I said in my uh, answer to, uh, to uh, his first question, this is, with what we're saying to people is this is not a question of waiting for the tests. Don't wait until you've got a sample in and you know what the result of the test is. 
is. So far, 100% of the samples that have come in have proved to be combustible. So work on the assumption that you should be doing the fire safety checks now. That's what we're telling people to do. We know that parts of the private sector are also doing, uh, doing their work in terms of fire safety checks. But my, my response to all those who have buildings that are covered by this is do the fire safety checks with the fire service. Take any measures that are necessary to ensure fire safety, and the government will support you in doing that. Since 2010, only a third of new schools have had sprinkler systems installed, so parents are rightly concerned about the safety for their children. In 2013, the Lacknell House Coroner's Letter formally recommended the Government should encourage providers of housing in high-rise residential buildings to consider retrofitting sprinklers. Two years later, Inside Housing reported that only 1% of council tower blocks had sprinklers fitting. Can the Prime Minister let us know what the Government actually did to encourage the retrofitting during the last four years? The government did indeed. The government did indeed ensure that uh, those local authorities were uh, aware of the recommendation that had come from the coroner. They did act on that recommendation from the cor coroner. But I say to the right honourable gentleman, if we look at what has happened and the identification of the issues in a number of tower blocks so far, um, the, there are various issues that lead to concern about fire safety. It is, uh, if we look at what has happened in Camden, for example, where one of the five blocks was considered to be habitable, but four of the five blocks were not considered to be habitable, that was not just because of the cladding, it was because of other issues in relation, for example, to the gas riser. All of these issues raise wider questions. They raise wider questions about the inspections that have taken place. They raise wider questions about residents' complaints. Uh, residents' voices not being heard. That was made, that's an issue that has been raised at Grenfell Tower. It's also an issue that has been raised in Camden. This is a much wider question. Uh, a terrible tragedy took place. People lost their lives who should never have lost their lives. We need to look at what has happened over decades in this country that has led to this position, and that's exactly what we will do. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, there have been two coroner's reports. Building regulations have not been overhauled, and local authorities, whilst asked to act upon them, have had their budgets cut by 40 per cent during that same period. Under, under her predecessor... Under her predecessor, fire safety audits and inspections were cut by a quarter. Fire authority budgets were cut by a quarter. Can the Prime Minister give an assurance to the House that the further 20 per cent cuts to the fire service planned by 2020 will now be halted? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that in his reference to the building regulations, I think he's somewhat missed part of the point in this, which is that it's not just a question of what laws you have, it's how those are being applied. And that, that is the issue. We have the building regulations about compliant materials. The question is, why is it that despite that, we have seen in local authority area after local authority area materials being put up that appear not to comply with those building regulations. And he talks about. And that is what we need to get to the bottom of. Why is it that fire inspections, that local authority inspections appear to have missed this essential issue? I think I can help the Prime Minister with this issue. When you cut local authority expenditure by 40 per cent, you end up you end up you end up with fewer building control inspectors. Lord, oh dear. It's pretty bad when people shout. For somebody to be sitting right by the speaker's chair and shouting displays, let's say, a lack of wisdom, which should not be repeated. Every order. Every member in this chamber must and will be heard however long the session has to run. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I was simply making the point, which seems to have upset a lot of members opposite, that when you cut local authority budgets by 40 per cent, we all pay a price in public safety. Fewer in 
inspectors, fewer building control inspectors, fewer planning inspectors. We all pay a price. And, Mr Speaker, those cuts to the fire service have meant there are 11,000 fewer firefighters. The public sector pay cap is hitting recruitment and retention right across the public sector. What the tragedy of Grenfell Tower has exposed is the disastrous effects of austerity. The, the, Mr Speaker, this disregard for working class communities, the terrible consequences of deregulation and cutting corners, I urge the Prime Minister to come up with the resources needed to test and remove cladding, retrofit sprinklers, properly fund the fire service and the police so that all our communities can truly feel safe in their own homes. Mr Speaker, this disaster must be a wake-up call. The cladding of tower blocks did not start under this government. It did not start under the previous coalition government. The cladding of tower blocks began under the Blair government. The, the right honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman, talks about local authority resources and talks about changes to the regulation. In 2005, it was a Labour government yep. that introduced the regulatory reform fire safety order, which changed, changed the requirement to inspect a building on fire safety from the local fire authority, uh, which was usually the fire brigade, to a responsible person. The legislation governing fire safety in tower blocks um, was, and this was commented on by the Lackanall House report in, uh, into the, that fire. It criticised that 2005 order, which had been put in place by the Labour government. Prime order. The Prime Minister's answer must be heard, and it will be. Prime Minister. And laws which took effect in 2006 ended the practice of routine fire service inspections, passing the responsibility to councils. That is why I say to the right honourable gentleman, this should be an issue that across this House we recognise is a matter that has been developing over decades, is a matter that has occurred under governments of both colours, under councils of all political persuasions, and is something which I would hope we would say we should come together and ensure that we we get to the answers of why this has happened over many years, what has gone wrong, and how do we stop it from happening in the future. Order. Understandably, on this most solemn and sensitive of matters, the front bench exchanges have been perhaps inevitably and perhaps rightly very comprehensive. I am now keen that all backbenchers scheduled to take part should have the opportunity to do so. Mr William Bragg. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, businesses in my constituency share the Prime Minister's desire to provide certainty for trade arrangements in the years immediately following our exit from the EU. Can my right honourable friend confirm that any transitional arrangements would be for a strictly time-limited period and that any suggestion of ever-retreating deadlines, a perpetual status quo, would fall short of honouring the decision made by the people of this country to leave the EU? Well, my my honourable friend is absolutely right. For very practical reasons, when we know what the future relationship with the EU will be, we may need implementation periods. We made that point in our Article 50 letter to ensure that the practical arrangements can be put in place for that new relationship. But I am very clear this does not mean unlimited transitional phase. We are going to leave the European Union. That is what people wanted and that is what we will deliver. Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the announcement of the prosecutions on Hillsborough and congratulate the families and all those involved in the many years of campaigning yeah, to yeah, achieve yeah, justice? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the Scottish Secretary insisted that Scotland would see increased funding 
if the DUP secured money for Northern Ireland ah, as part of a confidence and supply deal, quote, insisting, as I quote, I am not going to agree to anything that could be constructed as backdoor funding to Northern Ireland. Ah. Did the Prime Minister receive any representations from her Scottish Secretary about the DUP deal, either before or after it was signed? Can I say to the uh, the honourable gentleman? But of course, when we look at what has happened in terms of funding for the rest of the United Kingdom, in the autumn statement last year, my right honourable friend the Chancellor set aside an infrastructure fund of £23 billion. We are putting more money into our NHS, more money into uh, our schools. And of course, there is an impact on Scotland as a result of that autumn statement. £800 million extra spending is going to Scotland. As a result of the budget, £350 million extra is going to Scotland. I don't remember when that money was announced for Scotland, the honourable gentleman uh, complaining about that more money should be going to Northern Ireland. But then, of course, he's a nationalist and not a unionist. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's failure to give a straight answer to that question speaks volumes. Let's hear the fella, Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's failure to give a straight answer to that question speaks volumes and has only succeeded in piling more pressure on the Scottish Secretary, whose position now looks less secure with every day that passes. The Honourable Gentleman's question, and I think he's reaching his peroration, must be heard. I will give the Prime Minister one more opportunity. Did she, did she receive any representations about the DUP deal from the Secretary of State for Scotland, yes or no? I can, I can assure the honourable gentleman that I regularly receive representations from the Secretary of State for Scotland about, uh, about matters relating to Scotland, including regular representations which point out that if the Scottish nationalists actually have the interests of Scotland at heart, they will want to remain part of the United Kingdom. Given that rail passengers in my constituency in Lewis are once again facing rail min- misery with an overtime ban and strike action looming, does the Prime Minister not agree with me that the only way to end the 18 months of rail misery for my constituents and all passengers on Southern Rail is for the unions to stop their strike and get back round the table? Yeah. On the yeah. Yeah. My, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Southern Rail passengers have been experiencing absolutely unacceptable. Uh, delays and disruption to their service. And an expert report has found that the main cause of widespread disruption was union action. So I say, for the sake of the passengers, get round the table and solve this dispute. Ian C. Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for coming to my constituency of Wrexham during the general election (laughs) campaign? for making a widely welcomed U-turn on the dementia tax. Can I invite the Prime Minister back to Wrexham (laughs) to make another announcement reversing her appalling cuts to police budgets, which my constituents want to see the back of? We are protecting police budgets and we... uh, Yes. We are, we are protecting police budgets. We are, of course, but we are, of course, making reforms to policing. That's why I introduced the National Crime Agency to deal with serious and organised crime that actually relates to crime on the streets. That's why we have put money into a new national cyber crime unit to ensure that police can deal with the new sorts of crimes that there are that they are having to deal with. Yes, we're reforming policing, but the key to this. It's not about the number of police on the streets. The key to this is about what happens to crime. And crime has fallen to a record low. Richard Graham! The Speaker, the Grenfell Tower tragedy shocked so many of us because we all believe there is much that should never have happened. But to claim, as the opposition front bench did, ahead of any inquiry, 
that, quote, residents were murdered by politicians, unquote, is grotesquely inappropriate. So would my right honourable friend confirm that our government will get on with helping rebuild lives and homes and progressing critical inquiries with urgency and, above all, non-partisan calm? Well, I think my, my honourable friend raises a very important point. What all of those affected by Grenfell Tower deserve is an inquiry that gets to the truth and provides them with the truth and with knowing who was responsible. We need to do that in a careful, calm and determined way. We also need to use that same calm determination to ensure we get to the bottom of this wider issue of why it is that materials have been used in uh, tower blocks around the country which uh, we appear to be non-compatible, non-compliant with the building regulations. There are real issues here. We're not going to get to the truth by pointing fingers. We will by calm determination. Mr Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Regarding this uh, deal that she's done with the DUP, is it true that on the one hand she's shelling out all this extra money to secure their support, whilst on the other hand she's still giving them taxpayers cash in the form of short money to be in opposition? Is that what we get from this Prime Minister? No pay rise for the nurses, but double bubble for her friends in the DUP. Let's be, uh, let's be clear about what the government has done in the agreement with the Democratic Unionist Party. Uh, as a result of this election, there was no party that had a majority in this House. Only, yes? Only, uh, the only part, the party that had. The party that had the largest number of seats and the only party that can form an effective government is the Conservative Party. That's, that's the right thing to do, and that's what we've done. Charlie Elphick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the, uh, does the Prime Minister share my concern that last year 50,000 people were stopped at the controls at Calais? It's 150 people every single day. Uh, and does it underline? Uh, not only that we should keep those controls in place, but we should consider the case for investing more in state-of-the-art technology and in more border officers there so we can win the war against the people traffickers and keep our borders safe and secure. Prime Minister. Yeah, I have to say to my honourable friend that our border force officers are doing an excellent job at the uh, juxtaposed controls and the work that they do in his constituency, and particularly the work they're doing to stop illegal immigrants and the human traffickers. And uh, they have indeed, we have been investing in the system capabilities. 108 million has been invested in the last two years in new technology, and a further 71 million is earmarked uh, for that in this current financial year. But of course, there are particular pressures on Dover. That's why we've also invested more money to main secu maintain security there and ensure that Calais camp remains closed. And we're taking, uh, uh, making efforts upstream as well to ensure that we reduce the number of people who are trying to get to the United Kingdom illegally. And DFID are now putting extra focus on the central Mediterranean route. As I announced last week, an extra £75 million is going for humanitarian support there. Jay Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I know the Prime Minister is well aware of the misery and suffering that is caused by reckless gambling. <laughs> and following her recent <laughs> own experience... <laughs> Her own experience and the turmoil it has caused to her friends and colleagues. Will she now commit to legislating against fixed odd betting terminals, the cause of so much hardship across our communities? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, as the Honourable Lady knows, a consultation was undertaken in relation to that particular issue, which the Department for Culture, Media and Sport are, current, are considering, and will announce a response to that in due course. Suella Fernandez. Yeah. Yeah. In Fairham, 63% of voters chose the Conservatives, yeah. giving us a record, yeah. a, a share of the vote not seen since 1935. Will my right honourable friend join me in reminding the Chamber that this side won the election yeah. and the other side lost? Yeah. Join me in thanking... Join me in thanking the good people of Fairham for placing their trust in the Conservatives and re reassuring them that she is the best person to deliver a prosperity-led and successful Brexit. I uh, thank my honourable friend. I'm very happy uh, to join her in thanking the good people of Fairham for re-electing a first-class Member of Parliament to this. Yeah. 
repre uh, to represent them. And she's absolutely right, of course. It was the Conservative Party that got the highest percentage share of votes in this election. Conservative Party that got the most seats, 56 more seats than the Labour Party. And the Conservative Party that got more votes. And that's why we're an effective government. Mr Ian Austin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister confirm that last week Britain's four most senior police officers, the Commissioner of the Met, the heads of counter-terrorism, the National Crime Agency and the Police Chiefs, the police Chiefs Council, all wrote to the Government saying the counter-terrorism policing and protective security grant is being cut by 7.2 per cent. And doesn't this show, doesn't this show, contrary to what she just told my honourable friend, the member for Wrexham, that her promise to protect police budgets yeah. is not being kept. Yeah. No, as I've said earlier, we have protected counter-terrorism policing. We've put money in. We've also, we've also put money into uh, an uplift for an uplift in armed policing. And I and uh, the. The Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police has made the point that the Metropolitan Police are well resourced and have a wide uh, diversity of tools that they can use in countering terrorism. And that's the point. It's not just about the funding. It's about ensuring they have the powers they need to deal with the terrorists. And that's what we're determined to ensure. Leo Doherty. As member for Aldershot, the home of the British Army, yeah, yeah. I was deeply alarmed to hear the reported announcement made by the Leader of the Opposition whilst at Glastonbury Festival that he, if in power, would abandon Trident yeah. utterly, and utterly undermine the security and safety of our country. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that it is only her government and the Conservative Party yeah. that can provide the safety and security our great country needs? Yeah. Can I, can I first of all welcome my honourable friend to his place in this House? I'm sure he is going to be, as was his predecessor, a fine representative of the people of uh, Alder, the Aldershot constituency. And can I join with him in saying that I think people were shocked to hear that in public the Leader of the Opposition appeared to support Trident, but in private said he wanted to scrap it? Uh, it's only, only the Conservative Party. Only the Conservative Party that is clear about retaining our nuclear deterrent. And in the case of the Leader of the Opposition, it appears he says one thing to the many and another thing to the few. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, after being fairly defeated by my honourable friend, the member for Perth and North Perthshire, this government has nevertheless seen fit to award the defeated candidate and give the unelected Dean Duncan a peerage and a job in the Scotland That's office. Right. Yeah. Instead of this affront to democracy, and in light of the need for a legislative consent motion at Holyrood, does she not think she should stop treating the Scottish people with contempt and do the right thing and give the Scottish government a seat at the Brexit negotiations table? Yeah. We have. Uh, we have, throughout the time uh, that we've had so far in relation to the Brexit issue, been working with and talking with the Scottish Government and, indeed, other devolved administrations, and we will continue to do that. And I, I hope and trust, from the nature of the Honourable Gentleman's question, that this means that, from now on, the Scottish Nationalists are going to be focused on issues that matter to Scotland other than independence. Marcus Fish. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, is the Prime Minister aware of the current crisis in Venezuela, and is this an example of how an experiment in socialist revolution can go horribly wrong? Yes. I, 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 have, I have to say to my honourable friend that I think he's made an extremely important point. And I hope the Leader of the Opposition has heard what he's had to say. Indeed, I have to say, sometimes when we're talking about trade deals in the future, I think that the Leader of the Opposition and his Shadow Chancellor think that the only good trade deals are with Venezuela, Cuba and North Korea. Yeah. Marion Fellows! Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Speaker. The brave men and women in our emergency services have consistently put the safety of others first, and especially in response to the terrible events we have seen in recent months. We all pay tribute to the professionalism. That is why I believe it is important that we give them all the resources they need to do their vital job. In Scotland, it is outrageous that police and fire services are required to pay VAT. Order, Mr. Cleverly. Order. You are usually the embodiment of calm, repose, and potential statesmanship. Take some sort of tablet, man. Mrs. Fellows must be heard. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. I'll yeah. repeat that. It's And this has cost the frontline services £35 million pounds last year alone. Now that the Prime Minister has found the magic money tree, will she extend the VAT exemption to police Scotland? We've got the gist of it. The Prime Minister. When the Scottish Government took the decision to merge Scottish police forces into a single force, Police Scotland, they were told that this would lead to VAT being paid by Police Scotland. They were advised that that was the position, and they chose to go ahead with the merger. Mrs. Anne Main. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today is the, is the Festival Saints Day of St Albans, and his pilgrimage was celebrated Hooray! on Saturday. Can I ask what more could be done to protect all persons of faith who are being persecuted for their faith, particularly our students on campuses who are suffering large amounts of anti-Semitism? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to recognise St Albans Day, as my honourable friend has, uh, has said, and she's absolutely right. It is important. Sometimes uh, we talk a lot about people who are being persecuted for their faith in countries abroad. Actually, we need to be very clear that, sadly, we do see people here suffering attacks, particularly of anti-Semitism, on, uh, uh, on campuses. Uh, the uh, CST do a lot of work with students to support that. I'm happy that the government is supporting them. We're also supporting uh, Muslim communities who are suffering from Islamophobia. There is no place for such hate in our society, and we must all work to stamp it out. Paula Sheriff. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The current Prime Minister recently visited my constituency. Upon being asked about the precarious situation, situation facing both Dewsbury District Hospital and Huddersfield Royal Infirmary, she stated, and I quote, that people were scaremongering. Can she therefore use this opportunity today to reassure my constituents that all services will be retained at both hospitals, including a full A&E provision? Yeah. The, uh, the Honourable Lady knows, yes, I was asked about Dewsbury A&E, and I can confirm Dewsbury A&E is not closing. <laughs> the, service, the service will be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the majority of patients will see no change to their service. <laughs> Mr Philip Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The repeated claim that spending ever-increasing amounts of money on overseas aid keeps this country safe has been shown by recent events to be utter nonsense. Can I tell the Prime Minister that spending more and more money on overseas aid each year does not make us look compassionate to the public, it makes us look idiotic to the public when that money is much needed in the United Kingdom. So can she... Can she promise to slash the overseas aid budget, spend it on priorities in the UK? I hope she doesn't have a strange political aversion to pursuing any policies that might be popular with the public. Well, I can, uh, I can assure my honourable. I can assure my honourable friend that I don't have that aversion, but on this issue I do take a, a different view. I think it is important that, given the uh, position that we hold, given the state of our economy as one of the largest economies in the world, that we are actually recognised uh, that we can help those around the world. Uh, we are seeing millions of people, and particularly girls, being educated as a result of the action that we are taking. I think that is important, and it is important. I recognise what my honourable friend has said, that we have suffered from terrible terrorist attacks here in the United Kingdom. Our services have also foiled a number of terrorist attacks in recent months and, uh, and going back. 
into, uh, into uh, over recent years too. But I think it is important that we are able to use our aid money to help to ensure good governance in countries so that we do not see the creation of spaces where the terrorists are able to train and incite others. Prime Minister and most of the Cabinet for visiting Ealing during the election because my majority went up 50 times. Yeah. Yeah. Look, 53,000 EU nationals reside in the London Borough of Ealing and they would now like some clarity on this fair and generous offer of how much extra their settled status applications are going to cost them and why it is that they're not going to be able to vote in local elections as now. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say to the, the Honourable Lady, I am uh, grateful she has described this as a fair and generous offer. I think indeed it is a fair and generous offer for people to ensure that they are able to stay here in the United Kingdom and that they will have rights here in the United Kingdom just as UK citizens have. Mr Kevin Hollinrake. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker. A significant number of charities including those looking after the most vulnerable disabled people in our society, are in fear of imminent closure due to the application of the national living wage to sleep in shifts, and HMRC's insistence that of six years back pay, despite that the advice only changed last year. Would the Prime Minister ask HMRC to suspend any actions until we can find a workable solution? My, my hon. Friend has raised a very important issue, and I know that it is one that he cares about particularly. Of course, it is through the national living wage that we are making sure pay is fair in all sectors, including in social care. But on the specific point he has raised, the Department of Health and other relevant departments are looking at this issue very carefully, because they want to ensure that enforcement protects low-paid workers in a fair and proportionate manner. We have invested more money in social care. As he will know, the £2 billion extra went in in the budget, and we do need to look at this issue on a longer-term basis, but I can assure him departments are looking at the specific issues that he's raised very carefully. Angela Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister think, like her Brexit secretary, <laughs> that it will be simple to deliver a free trade deal with the European Union? I, the, the Brexit Secretary and I have both said over uh, the last few months that we do think that a comprehensive trade agreement is not just possible but, is, but will be easier than other third party countries, third countries negotiating trade deals because, because at the moment we are operating on the same basis as other countries within the European Union and therefore uh, we are not negotiating in the same position as, say, Canada uh, and other countries from outside the European Union. So, yes, I think we can achieve that uh, comprehensive free trade agreement and it will be good for the United Kingdom and good for the European Union. Ben Bradley. Mr Speaker. Uh, would the Prime Minister agree with me that an opposition leader who claims to be all things to all men, saying one thing to remain voters in London and quite the opposite to leave voters in constituencies like mine, is actually no kind of leader at all? And perhaps that might be why voters in my constituency rejected his leadership in the recent election. Well, I'd uh, first of all like to welcome my honourable friend to his place in this house. Uh, and uh, I was very pleased to visit uh, the, his constituency during that election campaign. He's absolutely right. What people want to know is what the position of uh, the parties is on this question of Brexit. We're very clear that the country, what we want to see now is the country coming together because we want to deliver on the will of the British people, which was that we should leave the European Union. It's precisely what this government will do. Barry Sherman. Mr Speaker, can I beg the Prime Minister at this crucial time in our country's history to listen to the many friends that we have in Europe and in the rest of the world who fear that we are sleepwalking, zombie-like, to a disastrous deal with Europe? They have no confidence in the three ministers in charge of the deal and believe that our country is going to be deeply damaged, both in terms of our economy and our role in the world, if we do not get our act together. I have to say to the honourable gentleman that the Brexit negotiations have now started formally. The formal negotiations have now started. There was a very constructive and positive start to those negotiations with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, and the Commission's appointed negotiator, Michel Barnier. We have set up three uh, working groups dealing with 
uh, key issues initially, including citizens' rights. I'm pleased about that. And we've also started a dialogue on the issue of the border between Northern Ireland and uh, Ireland and that relationship, which is important for Northern Ireland but also for the whole of the United Kingdom. We have published, uh, we've set out our objectives, we've published our white papers, uh, we will be bringing the repeal bill before this House. We know the plan we've got. The party that doesn't know what its plan for Brexit is, is his party. Yeah. Bob Neill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister was crystal clear on Monday that the reciprocal agreements we seek on citizenship should include the people of Gibraltar. Yeah. On Tuesday, the Spanish Foreign Minister sought yet again to suggest that Spain should have a unilateral veto on this. Ooh, Will she make it quite clear that this posturing and yeah, game playing yeah, yeah. is pointless and counterproductive, yeah, that yeah. our commitment to Gibraltar is absolute, and perhaps yeah, yeah. send him a hearing aid? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I thank my honourable friend for raising that particular issue. This government's commitment to Gibraltar has not changed, and it will remain. Yeah. The Nigel Dodds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Su- suicide rates in Northern Ireland, and particularly in my constituency, and issues of severe mental health are some of the worst in Europe and indeed the developed world. And clinicians and others have pointed to the legacy of 30 years of terrorism and violence and the awful effects of that. Part of the money that we have, are investing this week goes to mental health care, yeah. extra investment in the health service. Yeah. Isn't it time that people recognised that this is delivery for all of the people of Northern Ireland across all sections of the community yeah. and it is going to help some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in Northern Ireland? And people should get behind it and welcome it. Yeah. My right hon. Friend makes a very important point on this. this. Uh, It is the case, as we said in the agreement, that we recognise the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland that have uh, have arisen as a result of Northern Ireland's history. And as he says, uh, there will be mental health issues that arise as a result of that. And I think it is important. It's important we put a more into mental health generally across the United Kingdom, which we are doing. And yesterday I visited a school in Bristol to see some of the first training that is taking place of teachers in schools to help them to identify mental health issues among young people and be able to deal with those. But as he says, that money is for the good of all people in Northern Ireland across all communities. Mr Peter Bone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wonder if the Prime Minister has an opportunity to see the British Attitude Survey today which stated that 75% of British people wanted to leave the EU, up 20% from last time. She will, of course, know that more than 80% of the British electorate voted for parties that want to leave the EU. She will also know from her extensive canvassing, and mine, I, I know personally, that thousands and thousands of people tell me the referendum decided the issue, just get on and leave the EU. And would she assure the House that she will make that her priority? Well, my my honourable friend is absolutely right. What I have seen across the whole of this country is a real unity of purpose for people. Regardless, uh, for most people, regardless of how they voted in the referendum, their view is the decision has been taken, just deliver it, and that's what this government will do. Finally, Rachel Reeves. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. With nine million people in our country, lonely all or most of the time, and loneliness as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, will the Prime Minister uh, join with the Honourable Member for South Ribble and myself in encouraging uh, members from across the House to attend the Joe Cox Loneliness Commission event in Speaker's House, immediately ask the Prime Minister's questions today, to find out what all of us can do in our communities to tackle this blight in our society? The the Honourable Lady has raised a very important point, and I would like to commend her and my Honourable Friend, the Member for South Ribble, for the work that you are both doing as co-chairs of the Joe Cox Commission. I indeed encourage members of the House to do exactly as she has said. She has raised an important issue. I think we all increasingly recognise the impact that loneliness has on health. Um, Of course, we have been able to uh, put some uh, support into the Dementia Friendly Communities Programme. The Cabinet Office is doing more in putting some money in grant funds to particularly help to tap the skills of volunteers over 50 in looking at these issues of loneliness. But it's an important issue, and honourable members should uh, recognise that and recognise the work of the Joe Cox Commission. Thank you. Order. 